Hi and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I thought today I would share a couple of um, short videos on um, two photographers, Australian photographers. I try to uh, do things on Australian photographers and authors from time to time and uh, I want to concentrate on two today. This first video is about a photographer well known in Australian photography circles and in the wider historical um, archives of Australia, um, Frank Hurley. And uh, I have a book I'm going to just, I've just finished reading this book, I'm going to show that to you in a minute. And uh, just talk a little bit about him and there'll be some links underneath to some videos on YouTube that you can see about his life. A truly remarkable man, quite a controversial man in his day. The other one I'm going to talk about is a, a much lesser known photographer, but if he had have lived beyond his um, young years, uh, he died reasonably young, um, he um, would have become just as famous and well known, I think, in some ways, but a very much different personality from what I can gather, uh, to Frank Hurley, and his name is Ronald K. Monroe. I think it's M-O-N-R-O. And uh, so I'll talk about Frank Hurley first, and then I'll stop, and then I'll do one on um, on Ron Monroe. And uh, so I hope you like these. There'll be links on under both of these videos about the work of these two men, and I've also written about Ron Monroe on my blog before, so there'll be a link to what I've put there before. So anyway, here we go. Frank Hurley, A Photographer's Life. Frank Hurley, this is a beautiful, big, thick book. It took me quite a few weeks in dribs and drabs to read this, and there's a lot of information in it, and really quite spectacular. Frank Hurley was a, a gentleman who, um, uh, he, he ran away from home, Australian man, ran away from home when he was quite young, and was away from home for quite some time. Um, became a what they call a self-made man and learnt lots of skills through different people that helped him along the way, came back home again and uh, found his way into photography through someone else who mentored him a bit and um, he ended up doing some amazing things um, both in um, uh, polar exploration, he was involved with Sir Ernest Shackleton and Sir Douglas Mawson, both famous Antarctic explorers and uh, also he was a, a war photographer and also he was involved in doing other things in other countries. He did a lot of work in Papua New Guinea. And uh, he was also a pioneer of feature films uh, back in the silent days to start with. And then also in the, um, when the talkies started coming in, I think he was just on the end, just on the edge of that when that was starting to happen. Um, he was a very um, uh, strange man in some ways. He was very ambitious and very much an entrepreneur way ahead of his time. And um, he was always looking for angles. He was had a great photographic eye and was very much a photographer as far as his scenery is concerned. But uh, he tried to make money out of doing these expeditions and having people um, uh, pay for him to become the official photographer on these expeditions. Also, um, he uh, tried to make some money out of the films that came out of them and some of the uh, feature films that he made later on. Um, but quite a controversial character. He was well known for the fact that um, uh, he he could see a you know he had a photographer's eye, and you look at his work and you can see that he certainly had a photographer's eye. But he was not um, always convinced that what he was photographing uh, was what people needed to see. So he had this idea that um, if he did composite photos, well then people would get the full picture. You know they say that every picture tells a thousand words but he tried to by uh, manipulating in the the dark room which is done very much these days on photoshop and everything else under the sun he tried to give people the full picture not just a one snapshot of what was going on in front of him but collectively what had happened in that area in that location and he recreated scenes did all sorts of things and some people thought he was cheating a bit but he was just a very talented person and uh, a very hard-working photographer and he was, this is back in the days of glass plates and all that sort of stuff and, and uh, cranking movie cameras. On the front here you can see this movie camera he had in the Antarctic that he would crank that by hand, I think. And he went to great lengths to get shots from up on the top of the mast of the ship, the Endurance, which eventually sank in the ice. And um, he would climb up to the top of the mast and take stuff down below. On that, um, this one here, on this, uh, I don't know what you call that, the the sprit or the, the bow or the, the, the mast that's coming out the front of the boat. He used to go right way out there and take photos of the, the boat coming towards him. 
hovering over there, cranking, hanging on with one hand and cranking his 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 camera with the other. And um, he first learned how to do that sort of thing by when he was younger, taking photos of trains in Sydney or somewhere. He'd get on the track and take a photograph, a moving photograph of an oncoming train or stills, and then jump out the way at the last minute. So he learned how to live dangerously with his photography. <coughs> An amazing person. I might read a little bit of some of this here. And uh, yeah, he uh, just did it all, really. And it's interesting, though, that he needed to make a dollar. He had a family. He married this lady he met overseas who was an opera singer. And uh, they married. And uh, she moved to Australia. They had four children, I think, four or five. And um, But he was always away from home. And his wife basically had to make her own way living in various houses in Sydney and the kids were, were left to their own devices. He would come home sometimes and but but uh, he was not always um, he, he loved his garden apparently but um, his family life was a little bit different although one of his daughters actually became a photographic journalist as well I believe so they would have to tell you what life was like with Frank and their mum but uh, for some reason or another they, they seemed to cope and uh, his wife seemed to be very devoted to him all her life. So an interesting story. So what can I tell you? I mean, there's a lot you'll find on the links underneath about uh, Frank Hurley. And um, he mixed with other famous photographers and famous... And he, he, he wined and dined with overseas royalty and all sorts of people in, in different circles. And um, was, was very well known uh, back in the day, but quite controversial. And uh, he had a... Um, interesting um, relationship with people like Douglas Mawson and Shackleton who were famous explorers and um, but for some reason or other they used to stick by him uh, but it wasn't always amicable between them so what can I read to you from just to give you a little glimpse of the man he was also one that he was um, he was very much a uh, entertainer um, a raconteur he was a very good public speaker he used to sh run all these lantern shows and slideshows and movie films, they'd pack out uh, picture theatres all around Australia and overseas showing his films, and he would get up as, as the narrator. And uh, and he would very much good at entertaining when he was in the confines of the um, Antarctic and when they were shipwrecked for some years or some months before they were actually eventually rescued when they were stuck on the ice. And he used to entertain um, his fellow travellers and workers from the boat and just incredibly remarkable person but at times he would spend a lot more time by himself in his dark room and and looking after his, his negatives and his films and and uh, had a really good eye he, he he considered he didn't really need a light meter he could tell what the exposures were going to be uh, just by looking at the scene and some photographers can still do that of course so I'm just going to read a little bit now just to give you an idea of the poetic nature of this man they were in, uh, this is, they arrived in a harbour, him and someone else. I can't remember who it is. It might come out in the reading here. But I'm uh, just reading, this is from page 149 of this book, which is by Alastair McGregor, uh, Frank Hurley, A Photographer's Life. I got it from one of my favourite second-hand bookshops. <coughs> so I'll just read out a little bit of this and quote from this. So bear with me as I read a bit, and then I might sign off after that. Just to, This is just to whet your appetite about Frank Hurley. <coughs> it is interesting, though, that after he, in the latter stages of his life, he actually still had to earn a living. And he actually did a lot of travel photography within Australia. I've got a couple of his books around the place here, just doing scenery and promotional book for tourist, comp tourist um, state tourism commissions and things like that, I think. So um, he was always uh, making a living out of his photography. So where are we? After a tedious six-week passage, tolerating a panicky Scottish skipper with a fondness for whiskey, who preferred to heave to each night within a sniff of ice, Hurley arrived in Leith Harbour, South Georgia, in late March. One pup, Blubber, had pegged out a victim of distemper on the voyage, and of the second, nothing more is said. Uh, they had lots of sled dogs on the boats. In those days and eventually they died and and some were eaten for um for food when they were running out of food uh so where are we the summer 
by this time was gone. Favourable working conditions would be scarce over the days ahead. Wales had become a rare as fine days. A state Hurley was quickly to blame on over-exploitation. So Hurley had no trouble hitching rides on a tossing rust-flaked craft, the Matilda, to several sites around the island. <coughs> With a Mr. Leesk, Pentor's second mate, acting as factotum, not sure what that word means, you better look that one up, Hurley camped, climbed, filmed and photographed his way through most of April. Grand scenery inspired words as bold as pictures, and his diary rings with soulful, if at times, laboured description. When his own words failed, Hurley reached for Coleridge and the Canadian poet Robert Service, a favourite on the AAE. Not sure what that AAE stands for. <coughs> on 5th of April, at the head of Cumberland Bay, they found a sheltered site for the tent in the centre of an artist's paradise. This is quoting Frank Hurley. In the centre of an artist's paradise, the hills and sward, a gaiety of tints that fill me with ecstasies, impossible to describe, he continued. The following day, the pair tramped to the Newmire Glacier, the top of which was crenult, crenellated, this is his words, whatever that means, crenellated into fantastic embrasures that rose terrace above terrace to some distant mist-shrouded peaks. There was none of the glum moralising of London. <coughs> Here was nature's morality. He might be quoting Jack London there, the American author, I'm not sure. Here was nature's morality. Hurley's sacred anthem, anthem voiced by service. This is the poet we were talking about before. It says this. This is from this um, uh, poem by service. Have you gazed on naked grandeur where there's nothing else to gaze on? Search the vastness for a something you have lost. Have you strung your soul to silence? Then for God's sake, do it. Hear the challenge, learn the lesson, pay the cost. Frank Hurley certainly paid the cost many times over looking for those perfect pictures and experiences. <coughs> the good weather held for a time, and despite the raw memories of Elephant Island, Hurley relished more Antarctic camping and even ate heartily nay, ravenously, of fine penguin and elephant steaks. This is from his diary. Fair that he could be excused for despising. A full moon rose, and penguins waddled unconcernedly on up the beach, venturing a passing snoot at the camera bag, and prompting lines from Hurley's beloved Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, I think. Oh, happy living. This is from the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Oh, happy living. Things no tongue. O oh, happy living things no tongue, their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Winter took hold as April waned. During one temp tempestuous week on the northwest coast, the tent was nearly blown into the sea. But between gales, rain and poor light, some dramatic footage of elephant seals was had, while King Penguins, their glorious breasts blazoning like shining metal, were etched onto colour plates. On the 26th of April, Haley sent word to Paris via a returning ship that he had secured a hundred colour plates and 4,000 feet of film. He deemed the results excellent. I'll stop there, give you a little bit of a glimpse at the life. Look at the links uh, uh, about Frank Hurley and there are lots of books about him and people have uh, done lots of talks about him on YouTube and whatever. Uh, an amazing man. Uh, Quite an incredible photographer and the equipment that he was using and the results he got and how he managed to drag all these things when they were marooned in, in Antarctica and still retrieve all of his negatives and and uh, movie film and get something out of them which you can still see to this day uh, a lot of his work is held in the Australian uh, War Memorial Library I think it is but um, there'll probably be some links there somewhere in the videos to where you can have a look at his works of art in his photography and his filmmaking so there you are Frank Hurley a photographer's life so uh, keep a look out for that one and I'll see you next time someone's trying to ring me see you later <laughs>